Podia? No. I guess I'm ready. Well, good morning, people. How's everybody today? All right, so we're going to do some reflection. Do you feel comfortable in receiving gifts or giving one? Both. Both. Good, good answer, Glenn. Good answer. How do you think that might affect your ability to receive God's gift for you? So how do you think that might affect? That doesn't sound too right, does it? How do you think, that's what it says, that you might... Say that again. And what do you think? In what way? Excellent. She said, uh, "It's say that again for us, real loud." Which part? <laughs> the first, both of them. If you have a hard time receiving a gift, then you have to have a hard time receiving what is the gift for us. So accepting it sometimes. If you have a hard time receiving, it's a hard time accepting it. Mm-hmm. All right, that's good. Why do you think that's? What do you like about that statement? I think that's an excellent statement. Just a second. Uh, can you, Brian, can you give us a mic? Somebody to take that mic around? Good. Oh, and you can do that. That's great. That way I don't repeat it. It's easier for me. All right. Annie, Annie has a question, answer here, too. Did everyone hear <coughs> What this lady had to say? Okay, go ahead, Ann. Well, I just said um, I accept it. I like what Dorothy said because I get like I'm uncomfortable receiving gifts because I'm kind of embarrassed and I think, oh, I don't deserve this. I'm not deserving to you know get me to do that. But you know, accepting God's gifts, that's true. You know, I don't think about it that way. Like I, God, excellent. God thinks we're all worth it, and I need to stop and think that way sometimes. All right. Anybody else on this question? Oh, yeah. Mr. Mason. Gift to Mr. Mason here. All right. Hear from our youth. That's good. Good. I want to pick on some people, too. Thank you, Elder Jeff. Mr. Mason. Personally, uh, when it comes to receiving gifts, especially gifts that I never asked for, I wouldn't exactly know what to do with them. Like I didn't have a plan on what I was going to do with them. Mm -hmm. And I tend to be content with the current situation I'm in already. Mm. That's what I've grown to be be in, like a pretty content situation in my opinion. So uh, when it comes to giving gifts, well, that's different. I know that I'm making people happy, so that makes me feel more content. Wow. Very good. Very good. And plus, I, thus, I also know what I'm doing with it. I have a plan. So I... uh, Impressive. I don't necessarily have something I don't need lying around, and instead I can just give it to somebody else who might need it. Excellent. All right, appreciate that. You wouldn't have to have a car lying around, would you? (laughs) (laughs) In fact, he does. All right, excellent. Anybody else on that? Good, good. I like this discussion. Spiritual gifts. In God's kingdom, gifts are for what? Service. And that's good, because in serving somebody, it should make you happy, shouldn't it? Rather than self-centered. That's what the kingdom of heaven is all about. All right. Find your ministry. 
And there are five key factors that the lesson brought out for us this week. First of all, is spiritual gifts. Then we have natural talents. Then there are passions. And then there are personalities, which is quite interesting. And finally, we're going to talk about experience. Those are the five things that's by finding your ministry. Has any of you have ever been in a church that where the spiritual gifts worked? You have, Dorothy. Tell me about it. Why did it work? In a lot of cases, we go through all these spiritual gifts, take the test, we think we got it ready, but then it doesn't go anywhere. So tell me, Dorothy, about the church that you've been the to. Church, they use spiritual gifts to fill the church office. Okay, go ahead. They use spiritual gifts to fill a church office. And so if there wasn't a spiritual gift to fill a certain office, they didn't just jam somebody in there like it said here. You only put the people in that had the spiritual gifts for it. Okay. Good. So let's take a look at each of these. So the first of all is the ministry's indicator talk, uh, studies about spiritual gifts. Um, that's the first one, actually, A. So you, study, so you study spiritual gifts. You take a test on spiritual gifts, but that's not enough. You experiment with different ministries. And lastly, you seek the confirmation of your spiritual gift from your church body. Did you do that, Dorothy, at all? With, with you, which, this was Ankeny, wasn't it? We did it more in Knoxville. Oh, in Knoxville, really? And it was successful. Really? Because I know two churches. One is Ankeny, and I didn't really, about Knoxville, how long ago was that when that was going on? Before we came to Ankeny. Before you? Yeah. Okay. That's great. That's great. So those are the five things. You study it, you take a test, you experiment with it, and also seek it. We're going to talk about a little bit of experiment. Anne was talking about fear or failure. Beware of failure. Now, someone in our lesson doc talked about the one talent of a man, of a, of a one talent man of Matthew 25 and verse 14 through 30. Why was he not successful? Why would you say he's not successful? He didn't use his own, his own, he was fearful of the, his boss, the landowner. Yeah. He was fearful, and he, so he was afraid of Just wait, just wait. Let you go, go ahead and repeat what you just said. I said he was fearful of the talent, so he hid it, so he didn't do anything with it. Why would you be fearful of a talent? Because you don't know what you're going to do with it. Um, you're not used to that. Um, like Mason was saying, it wasn't a part of your plan. So you just kind of poof it away, I guess. Do most people fear doing something in the church? Or do you think it just, they don't know what to do or what, what's happened? I think there's a combination. Um, first, you don't know what to do. Um, you've never done it, um, so you don't have that experience. You're afraid of failure, or you just feel like someone else should do it. You don't have the time. Good. All right. That's that's great. Shirley, you had a comment? Oh, good, good. We got some people picking up on it. I was just going to say that the reading brought out that he was, that the one talent man was fearful of the boss. He was afraid that if his talent didn't do anything or produce anything, or if he lost it, that he'd be in trouble with the boss. So to preserve the one talent, he buried it. All right. So it's one perspective of what God is like that could be, that can do that. Do you think God is one to be feared? I think some people fear God. themselves because they don't know what the church will say. You know, the church body can bend them if they fail. And I see you're agreeing. Why do you agree with your mother? Because she's your mother? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Speak up. Pull it up. Just, yeah, the whole thing about 
seeing what the kids will think and what people will say. Because, um, I mean, I've seen a lot of hurtful situations and many churches we've been in. And I guess I think, oh, what if, yeah, you know, what if they said this of me? And, you know, if I fail in this way or whatever. Um, yeah. What should I matter? <laughs> Pastors have a lot of fear, I can tell you that. Do elders? Depends on the elder. All right. Okay, good. Anybody else on that one? That comment? All right. His real problem is what Shirley was saying was this mental picture of the master. That's what he had. This would be an interesting one. Tell about a memor memorable failure in your life and what did, you, what did you learn from it? Failures can be good, can it? All right. Anybody have a story they want to tell about something where you failed? Failed miserably. Yes, Mike in the back. This happened when I was uh, going to Iowa State. And uh, my first, first week at uh, Iowa State, the got introduced to my house. House meeting on Monday night. Got introduced to my house. Tuesday morning, I'm walking to class, and uh, one of the guys from my house comes up and he's walking along with me. He asks me if I know this person from Nevada, and I proceeded to give him a 10 or 15 minute dissertation about how weird and strange and you know, whatever descriptive word I could come with, come up with about this uh, person from Nevada that he was asking me about. And when I finally stopped talking, he said, oh, that's my sister. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I've never forgotten that. <laughs> that, was, that was a classic, failure of character on on my part. I wanted the, the earth to open up and swallow me <laughs> away and to never be seen again. And um, I mean, I, I couldn't put any more food in my mouth if I tried. So um, I learned a lot, not only about myself, but about thinking of others at that moment. Good. Anybody else with a fear story? Yes. I have one, but it, uh, it affected me quite a bit. Um, how many of you have seen me solve a Rubik's Cube in less than 30 seconds? You saw me do it when I had a children's story I did. here quite a while back. Mm -hmm. If you start with a solved cube, there is a trick to messing it up where you turn a certain side, keep your thumbs in certain places, and you can mess it up. And then if you start from the same place and turn backwards, you can solve it in a few seconds. Well, when I was in college at Andrews University, one of our ministerial classes had us teaching a kindergarten class for one period for a whole week. My roommate and I were doing it, and I thought, this would be a good lesson for kids. Amaze these little kids. And the Rubik's Cube also had been used enough that if you turned one face and you flipped a corner, the whole thing would come apart. So I solved it and amazed the little kids, but then I said, well, and, and you, you got to, I used it as a moral lesson of how Jesus can you know, straighten up your life and how he could take care of you, et cetera. I said, but you gotta be careful because things don't always go bad. And I turned it and flipped it and parts went everywhere. Oh boy. And I had 25 kindergartners racing to pick up the pieces. I had not expected 25 kindergartners to be at my feet rumbling around. And so it, it basically taught me that sometimes you can be too smart for your own britches. <laughs> And kindergartners can teach you a well-versed lesson that you can fool some of them, but boy, they'll come back at you. 
That's good. Anybody else want to make a give me a failure story? Nobody? All right. But just reflect, that's kind of what we're talking about with that. Um, it's not the critic who counts. This is um, Theodore Roosevelt. It's not the one who points out how strong men stumble or how the doer of deeds might have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred with sweat and dust and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, who knows, knows great enthusiasm, great devotion, spends himself in a worthy cause, who, if he wins, knows the triumph of, of a higher achievement, or, or and, and who, if he fails, at least fails when daring greatly. So his place shall never be with those whose cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Isn't that good? I thought that's really good. How do you feel about trying new things? Let's pick on uh, Nicole. What do you think? What do you feel about trying new things? If All it's right. something that's going to benefit me in the long run, yeah, I'll go for it. But if it's something that I don't really am fond of, not really. All right. Yeah, I'll take you. Go ahead. Um, yeah, it kind of depends what it is. I mean, trying new things is always really interesting, and it can give you a new perspective on what it's like. You know, sometimes you have uh, judgments about something before you've actually tried it, and being able to try something new can give you a new perspective and see how it could really actually be. All right, give it to Owen. What do you think, Owen? Um, is it hard for you to try new things? Uh, yeah, like Fallon said, it really depends on what it is, but if you do try new things, yeah, you can get a different perspective on it. Or if you don't try new things, maybe you could learn from other people and they can convince you to. That's good. Learning from other people, you think that's good? I think that's excellent. If you don't know it, find somebody who can help you on that. All right, good. I knew you guys had it in you, young people. How often do you normally step outside your own comfort zone? Russell, I'm going to pick on you. Do you have comfort zones? Well, I suppose I have comfort zones. Um, I've been forced to get out of some comfort zones over the last seven years. That's true. <laughs> um, you still getting out of it? Oh, yeah, I have no choice. Driving a long ways from half from the house and mm -hmm. by myself has been a struggle for me. Um, a lot of prayers to try and survive those events. Mm -hmm. um, Do you find prayers help you? Yes, yes. I I don't feel that there's been any mir miraculous change in my attitude or my fears, but he's been able to get me through them the difficult times that I've faced. I can remember when you did face them and then where you're at now, it's, you've grown quite a bit, Russell. It's imperceptible from my perspective, more maybe than from yours. <laughs> you know, you, you live through it, you don't. Yeah. You don't see the improvements or the changes as, as you do. Yeah. Well, that's why we need the courage. We give it, uh, encouragement to one another. Isn't that right? Oh, absolutely. I, yeah. I wouldn't be here if not for the church family. That's good. That's good. That's what family's for, isn't it? Wouldn't you think that's true? If you know Russell, you, most of you know what we're t talking about, but that's... You've got some, some traumatic things, Russell. So that's good to say. 
about their spirits. It was excellent to hear that. In fact, what you just said had some healing moments. I mean, just the fact that you're feeling this discomfort with your church now, that, that healed, makes us feel better, doesn't it? So that's kind of a giving, receiving thing, so good. Anybody else on this one, this question? Yes, Glenn. Having worked on the uh, construction industry for most of my life, we had systems and methods, and uh, most of them were tried and, and true. But we were accused that the way we built houses, if they built cars like we built houses, we'd still be driving Model T Fords because we're using the same system. Although we've modified uh, different uh, materials on the inside and on the outside and the the insulations that we've used and all that, and, and it's got progressively better. Uh, to step outside your comfort zone, yeah, somebody would come along, a new person on their crew, and say, well, should we try this? This is the way that I've always done it. And, of course, the company I worked for, my boss was very progressive and did a lot of reading, and we come up with some real good methods, and so I would just very kindly say, well, why don't you just watch how we do it and, and compare your method to this one? And every time, most of them would say, I like yours better. It's easier. But so how, what can we learn spiritually? How would you apply this to our spiritual world? It's, it's the same. Uh, we get in a rut. We get in a uh, doing things that we feel are what we should do, but uh, when something new comes along, I can remember vividly when righteousness by faith came in. And it was hard to accept it. Why was it hard, Glenn? It was hard. But finally, once we accepted it, hey, it's increased our faith and, and we've gained more righteousness by doing it. And Why would you say it was hard? It first accept it. Right? Because it's something that we didn't do. It was a new concept. What did you do before that is new concept? I can't remember uh, very vividly, but uh, just doing the same things over and over, going to church and, and uh, uh, just uh, letting the pastor tell us what to do and we weren't going to prayer meeting and things like that. And, mm -hmm. But uh, once that new idea come about, it just made a change, and, and you wanted to change. But I think back about the spiritual gifts that you had there. How many of us even know in the Bible what the spiritual gifts are? So how can we be practicing them if we don't even know what they are? And that's why, you, if you look on the last part of this last four page, two pages of this lesson that we have today, that's the beginning of it. Or uh, that's the beginning of the spiritual gifts. Good point. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, I'm going to move this on. Here's a good one. This is a scenario. Frank had been the head deacon for three years. He procrastinates and is terribly disorganized. Other deacons complain that he has no schedule for them to follow. Church repairs are often left undone. Frank has spoken about these weaknesses several times without improvement. He says he feels called to this office. What should the body of Christ do? All right, let's do the question. Well, first of all, has, has the other deacons talked to Frank about the situation? Um, what have they done to help Frank in his disorganization and his procrastination? Is it the only thing they're worried about, his church improvements? The role of a deacon is much more than just church improvements. So to me, I probably went the wrong direction where the writer wanted it to go with this, but... No, no, it's I, I've got questions first. We, we tend good. to jump to, well, let's kick Frank out because he's not doing his job. But let's help him first. 
Okay, and then the Shirley. Another question I had is, what is he thinking he's called to do? Maybe he's got a misunderstanding of what that position is. Interesting. All right, Shirley. I was going to say my my answer to this before Brian spoke even, but after he spoke for sure, would be, okay, what should the body of Christ do? They need to come alongside him. There needs to, there needs to be communication. They need to see if they can work with him, if they can maybe help him be more organized. And so, yeah, the body of Christ needs to come alongside. Good. Yeah. Encouragement. Anybody else? All right. Good, good, good comments here. Good comments. These are the natural gifts. All people have abilities that are invaluable to the church. You think that's true? Mm -hmm. Landscaping, for instance. Somebody can do landscaping, speaking, planning, repairing, cooking, pa painting, floral arranging, computer programming, sewing, conflict management. That's a good one. Counseling, graphics, right? Aren't they all needed? That's all needed there. It has to do, living your passion has to do with what, with what you care the most about. Example, children working with the elderly, working with the handicapped, working with the addicted, unwed mothers, homeless, and unemployment, racial inequality. So that's living your passion, what you care to do the most. And uh, we're gonna do two more here. What time do we need to quit? All right. These are their personalities. Remember on this one, they're the thinkers, the feelers, the introverts, the extroverts, the upfront, the behind the scenes, the rela relationship oriented, task oriented, organized, spontaneous. Where do you fit in at? What would you think describe you? Interesting, aren't they? Personalities. Not only you look at the personalities, but you look at temperament. Choleric. Power people. Sanguine. Fun loving. They like to be the life of the party. Phlegmatic. Peacemaker. Melancholy. Self sacrificing. They can also be perfectionists. Because I'm one of them. How does that work in a church? Do you need all three of those, four of those personalities, temperaments? Okay, Russell, he just shook his head. Why would you need them? Somebody give him a mic. Okay. Just a second. Get that mic to you. Try to make sense. Um, you need all kinds of different uh, types of people to uh, accomplish everything a church needs to, because you can't have everybody be the leader. Um, it's been my experience that if there's too many leaders, there's a, a lot of conflict figuring out which way to head with the program. And if there's nobody to help out, uh, uh, to follow a pro plan to help make sure everything gets accomplished, then it uh, falls apart. Mm -hmm. So you need all, all different types, maybe more of uh, the self-sacrificing than the power people. <laughs> Where's the, what about the phlegmatic? You know, a lot of people think that they're kind of Oh, what's the word? Milk Anything? toast. Milk toast, or they don't, they're not very friendly, right? But you need somebody back there who's kind of be a peacemaker. Power person, a lot of times they, they get, uh, they think they know what they're, what's better than somebody else, than some of the people, but, but, but the good thing about a power person is that he kind of moves, th he moves things along, don't they? So you need those kind of people too. Um, but once in a while you need a phlegmatic to make peace between people, isn't that right? <laughs> so I think that's, 
Interesting? So those are the basic type. Any questions on that or comment? Have you ever taken tests on those? Sometimes, sometimes they have two or more, one's, one stronger than the other. Last thing I'm going to talk about is your, in your book, it talks about experience. Five areas of experience. Education, that's helpful. Careers, spiritual journeys, previous ministries, what you've done before, and painful events. I grow in painful events. Do you? I think that's very important that we go through the painful events. Any questions on that or thoughts on those experience? That's what you kind of need people to experience. All right, notice this. Experience helps focus our attention and sort out our choices. It adds wisdom to reality, to the idealisms of our dreams. So I think that's quite interesting as we look at those type of things. All right, and I'm going to finish it. That's it. Any other questions or comments? Let me take you in the back of your, if you have your uh, sheet there, because I didn't get those put up there. Kind of ran out of time. On page 62, it shows you about the, uh, let's look at more of spiritual gifts. So, um, Let's take it. Somebody read some of those. Let's say knowledge. All I'm going to do is have you define it, what it is. So knowledge, somebody read that uh, first two paragraphs there. And knowledge, if you have your sheet. Katie? The ability to understand biblical truth with unusual clarity and insight. Okay, good. Somebody with wisdom. Somebody read wisdom for me. The ability to resolve life's problems and sort out difficult situations through the application of biblical truth. And read that paragraph just above that, that uh, text there. The text where it says Paul tells us. Mm -hmm. In 1 Corinthians 12, 8, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. All right. Tell me the difference between why do you need one with knowledge and with wisdom? What's the, why, why are they needed together there? Did you see that paragraph just below that? It says knowledge has to do with discovering truth, while wisdom has to do with its application to life. All right? And read for me uh, le leadership. In case you got that. Leadership. And then the first two paragraphs there in Romans, and then the next one after that. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh. We have different gifts. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. Okay, and then the next two just below. Repeat them right there. And uh, ability. Mm -hmm. Ability to set goals in accordance with God's purpose for the future and to uh, communicate those goals to others in such a way that they voluntarily and harmoni harmoniously work together to accomplish those goals for the glory of God. Good. See, that's a good leadership, a good leader there, isn't it? You like that as far as leading? Okay, next one is um, administration. Somebody read that for me. Where's that mic at? Right? Brian, you want to read that? First Corinthians twelve twenty eight. In the church, God has appointed those with gifts of administration. Okay, and then next. Describe that. The ability to organize and manage, working with and through others to achieve goals. Good. What's the difference between an administrator and a leader? If you read the next paragraph for me, Brian. A leader enables a group to figure out where it needs to go. A gifted administrator works out the details of how to get there. A pastor may not have this gift, Paperwork piles up, phone calls go unanswered. Meetings are disorganized and disjointed. Plans are made but not delegated or followed up. A wise church will allow its pastor to work his strengths and delegate his weaknesses. Rather than berating the pastor for not having the gift of administration, a mature church will connect him with those who do have the gift and are willing to work as a team. Pastor Ryan, do you like that? Why do you like that? Um, maybe I don't have that gift. 
<laughs> Great question. All right. Let's go to teaching. Let me read that for teaching. In Romans 12, 6 and 7, we read, we have different gifts. If it is teaching, let him speak. The ability to explain clearly and apply effectively the truth of the word of God. All right, let me read that last paragraph. I think that's good, too, that just in that same section there, Jesus Christ. Jesus was, of course, the master teacher. Matthew tells of that the uh, outdoor classroom in which Christ gave his life-changing Sermon on the Mount. He began to teach them, saying, He knew how to reach people of all backgrounds and temperaments. He could teach all groups of learners, auditory, visual, and kinetic. Okay. That's important, too, isn't it? understand those people and people have certain ways of learning other people that other people do so healing give me the one in healing that's the last one then we'll close it let me read healing for me anybody I'll do it first Corinthians 12 9 to another, the gifts of healing by the same talent. If we flip over the next page, it says, Divine enablement to be God's channel to restore people to health. All right, good. Any thoughts as we close? All right. Russell. Yes, Russell. When you face a huge trial or, or devastation in your life, you can come out of that one of two ways, closer to God or further from God. Always choose to be closer to God, even though it's not easy, and it's probably the last thing you feel like doing. Try to be closer to God, though, and uh, think, think of it that way. Make a conscious choice. Excellent. You know, when, when we talk about healing, one of the best ways to heal is to talk about it with someone that you can confide in. And I remember there was a, um, we, we were learning some things in, as pastors, and they said that 60% uh, of problems can be solved if people just listen and let them talk it through, but you just, and you just listen it without making any kind of comment. Just care. 60% could, be, could help that. So I thought that's pretty good. Remember that, them telling us that. All right. Pastor Brian, I'm going to ask you to close with prayer, would you? I'm going to take you out of comfort zone, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are thankful for the opportunity we've had here today to worship in this small group in this church family. Lord, we ask that you would bless us as we go out for the rest of this week and that we're able to keep focused on you for the rest of the Sabbath and the rest of the week. Lord, we pray that you draw close to us and lead and guide this church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right.